Here's an oldie, but a goodie? I don't know. I have a feeling it came with some very big speakers. This is a Sony home audio system. Model Shake 77. I got a funny feeling they, they, um, they had a very big subwoofer involved somewhere there. Anyway, uh, large volume control. I mean, it's the most prominent feature of this thing. So, clearly volume is their target. And Happy Neighbours isn't. So what's up with this? Well, they say there was a power surge and now it doesn't turn on, etc, etc. So let's plug it in and prove that theory. Yeah, where are we? Definitely no lights at this stage. We have a soft on button here. And it is totally dead. Oh, you know what that means. Cover off. Got a combination of uh, hex key and Phillips around the back. And we'll get this elaborate thing apart. Well, the screws out the back take those covers off. And there's a screw there, and the ones in the side. Is it going to slide forward or out? Or maybe we have to bend that out and just lift it off? think might be the go. Sure is a lot of dust in this one. This looks like our output stage. Um, possibly class D. Big water heat sinks with a fan behind it. We've got our brains and CD mechanism there. Uh, the power supply is going to be underneath the CD mechanism it looks like. This might be a complete teardown job just to get somewhere. But um, quite the carpet going on there. <laughs> Pretty nasty. So some screws to get the top CD mechanism off. Uh, and then we'll have to take the board off, I think, separately. And uh, we'll probably have to take this front panel off, unfortunately. But we'll see how we go. Probably a bit better. And then that seems to be mostly released. Do I need to? Uh, it needs to be ejected to take the front off the tray, otherwise, I can't get it out. Let's see if we can figure that out. I think maybe I need to unclip this top cover. If it'll let me. <laughs> I don't think it's going to really give me much access to the tray. <laughs> I can see the tray. But it's, the mechanism's engaged. Maybe I just have to take the whole front off with this attached. It's a bugger. We'll unplug the flex there. And this audio cable. This other cable. And we'll run down the side here. That little cable. I think this goes to the uh, limit switches. Tray in, tray out switch. If I had to guess. I don't think it goes to the motors, but I could be wrong. I think that's driven through this flex, the little the little flex. And then the pickups on that flex. Um, if I was to take the front off, what else would have to come? What do I have to undo? You wouldn't read about it. I was poking and prodding and trying to find hidden screws and stuff, and then all of a sudden... It just popped off. And it just has some... some little rubber locks in the corners that the... little plastic stud sticking up there pushes into. Little rubber retainer. And then we've got some screws on the bottom. Now do you think, with the screws gone, that it wants to come off now? Nope. <laughs> There's still something holding it down in the middle, it feels like. It's loose on the sides. There could be a screw through a PCB that's attached to the front plate. This is one large metal 
chassis right through there that the top sections are mounted on and it can undo. I'm thinking if I undo the back plate and these then the whole midsection will come out with the front perhaps. Because once I get these off I'm going to have to undo this plate to get underneath it anyway. So with the heat fan, fan uh, shroud removed from the top board it can be observed right down the bottom there there is a uh, another board that it won't focus on um, and let's see if I can get a better there we go so that board right down the bottom that uh, this cable plugs into there's a screw hole on the back which I have removed the screw and uh, that now allows the front panel to slide off. So that was the board in question there. Um, you will need to be watchful of a couple of uh, flex cables that come up. One here and one here. And they plug in here and here with this main flex. It plugs in the middle. Um, and that's pretty much all it's holding it on. So it's not too much of a uh, end game if you can't eject this. It does come off relatively easy as a whole unit. But now you can see, as I was saying before, this whole complete chassis plate that runs right across over the power supply board. So we'll just get those screws down the sides and the back panel will probably come off with it, I think. Screws along the back undone, screws down each side undone, and I think the whole thing will lift off as a unit. Unplug this flex from here, and this multi-flex cable here, there we go. That's the main power feed to the amp module, and here we are. I love stuff that's all modularized and makes it easy to work on. Need blimmin' e hearing protection when using this thing. That's fine. You put this on, it's incredibly loud. And when you flip this down, it's like you're standing behind a flipping jumbo jet. Let's check the obvious. We have some fuses. That's good. There's another fuse over here. Uh, it's not good. Uh -huh. We have one blown fuse. What's our actual resistance there? Probably just a circuit resistance. Thousands of mega ohms. There we go. And we have another fuse hiding down between these two caps. That's okay. Um, any other fuses? I don't see any. So at the moment we just have one blown fuse. Um, I'm going to say... Is this going to have power factor correction? This looks like a power supply for a TV, to be honest. Maybe they've repurposed it for this amplifier system. Uh, what do we got? There's a bridge rectifier under here. There's a bunch of transistors along here. Um, I think that is. I think this is power factor correction on this heatsink here and here. Then we've got our main switching transistors for here. Possibly creating a plus and minus rail for the amp. That's what I reckon. Without, well, I don't have to guess. It's printed on the PCB. We've got um, minus, plus and minus 62 and a half, 22 and a half, and yeah, then there's a, a 5, no, is there a 5? Okay, so there's a, oh, that's all 62 and a half, 22 and a half, ground, and then repeated negative 22 and a half, 62 and a half, uh, SPV, standby power, I'd say, that red line. But, but, maybe not, <laughs> let's not jump the gun, 
here's another connector and it's marked so we've got PCON power control uh, ACD ground ground and 13 and a half so this is our power supply for here which feeds the brains of it this is just the power supply for the amplifier stage this is the one that's not working we have a blown fuse why do we have a blown fuse let's check I think we're gonna to have to pull the board out now at this point um, measure our MOSFETs there um, our output regulator rectifier a bunch of screws holding it in because this fuse is okay there's a very good chance we have a charge build up on our main input capacitors so before we go and put our fingers all over the other side we will flip it over and check if there's anything remaining since it doesn't work it cannot deplete these now with it upside down this area is our uh, standby circuit um, it will be fed off the main caps so we don't need to worry about its own input capacitors being charged right how did the fuse blow uh, so here we have our input capacitor positive and negative uh, the negative runs down here and off into the circuit and the positive comes down to the here which is the fuse over to here and supplies the circuit that way uh, so if we went from negative to positive and check resistance there we have 465 ohms of course it's going to directly go to our transformer so there's a is that a, a wire link under there I'll just double check that so here's where our fuse enters and it comes along to here um, it goes through it looks like a resistor divider to drop the voltage for our control IC uh, that controls the switching of our switching transistors which are, are they there? no they're over here sorry uh, here's another IC here yeah um, that's your switching IC um, so one way or another it does that and then there's a wire link from here to here which goes through to our primary winding um, we have that goes through our winding and comes back down to uh, which IC is doing the switching okay it's this one here so we've got three legged one one two three center leg is going up to the other side of the winding there's another winding here which uh, is involved with this I think this may be involved with the feedback somehow anyway let's check our switching MOSFET so if we go diode mode and uh, the heat sinks on this side and always 99% uh, of the time at least if you're looking at the MOSFET as it would sit against the heat sink you've got your legs one two three is gate drain source um, most of the time and gate to drain is one one volt drop which is not shorted so it's good gate source 0.7 and drain source 0.45 so that's our body diode that's absolutely fine there's actually 0.4 the other way as well so be something else in the circuit giving us that reading um, then there's another transistor here which I think I don't believe it is a MOSFET um, but it could be uh, not really measure like anything there you go. 0.6 there and 0.6 there so base collector emitter is the likely setup on that one we don't have a collector to emit a short and base to collector and base to emitter are a 0.6 volt drop which is what you'd expect um, there's a bunch of other transistors and diodes in the area I suppose I could whip around and and just poke those and just see what are they doing is there anything strange going on there there's another one there they look alright a uh, small one there another little one there 
we're probably okay to replace that fuse and see what happens. I don't see anything physically damaged. I can't test anything as electrically damaged. Um, none of the main players that normally go bust. We could check the output side. Two pin diode rectifier across there and our main output capacitor here. So let's let's stop autofocusing in the wrong places. So our output rectifier diode is 0.4 uh, and our output um, capacitor that's fine I'm probably reverse polarity but it is not plenty of resistance there I think we just replace the fuse and see what happens grab the end of it and just rip it through wrapped the oh no they didn't <laughs> I say wrap the fuse around the end of uh, over to the other one done. This is a 1 amp fuse. I'm going to try and reuse the legs on this. It's not ideal. <laughs> they might end up being too short. I don't have a leaded fuse. I have a non-leaded fuse. I'll put leads on. I need to buy a bunch, but I don't do this stuff enough. It's you know, it's hard to know. You can't sort of buy buy everything just in case you get a job that needs it. This is a procedure I've done many, many times before, and it has never been an issue. Just hopefully the legs are long enough to come through, otherwise I have to do it again. Fuses love to retain a bit of heat too, so once you've um, done that, just be careful how soon after you hang on to it. Um, are we far enough apart? Ooh, just, just far enough apart. We'll test fit it. Yeah, looks a bit differently. <laughs> okay. Not quite as much of a stretch. Uh, we have plenty of lead length to work with. Just bend it over slightly to hold it in the hole. Now, of course, you've soldered the leg on. So, if you don't, uh, if you don't um, work quickly enough at this end, you're going to wind up desoldering it on the other side. Get some heat into the pad and then into the fuse. Hopefully, that was it. Yeah, it looks like it's on. I might just keep the iron on this side for a bit just to get some heat heat soaking into the pad so that we're not keeping a lot of heat on the uh, wire that we just soldered on first and then as the pad's warmed up it will help take solder a bit quicker like that. One shiny new 1 amp fuse but will it go? Place your bets. Betting ends! Well, that's disappointing. Um, I don't seem to have any, any voltage. Oh, 14 volts. Well, it's trying to make voltage. I wonder if it just needs to be plugged into its load. Clearly something going on there. Um, I guess that means our fuse is okay. So just checking is our fuse actually okay. Of course we're unplugged. Our fuse is okay. Hmm, I just, it's fluctuating a lot. It's, I think maybe it needs to be on a load to be able to regulate. Um, I think we plug it back into the chassis and just see what happens then. I will have it plugged in here so we'll uh, reconnect it 
and check the voltage here. Uh, it should be 13 volts as far as I can tell, always on. Uh, if we check in here, what do we got? Get a good connection or no good connection? No, we've got nothing. Okay, we'll just go up the line. Nothing, 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 still nothing, lots of nothing, and nothing at that end. Just having a look around the board, uh, there is a couple of dry or almost dry joints. You see there's a good crack, uh, cracked ring around that one. It's on the amplifier power supply, so I don't think that's going to be an issue. But it's interesting to spot anyway. So let's um, let's touch up some of these. Maybe it's just sort of come to light because of the board is quite heavy. The board's quite heavy and it flexes when you pick it up. So maybe it's been encouraged only recently from having moved it. I will check all of these big pins, the common areas of such issues. Now we're starting to come down into the section that that we need operating. Could be an issue with feedback. We can check our opto couplers. So using diode mode like we did earlier, we checked our switching transistor and other diodes in the area. Um, if we go across there, we've got a 1.5 volt drop. Uh, now just quickly, the way these work, this is an optocoupler, so these legs go to effectively an LED, and the LED shines light across a barrier. And then there is a transistor here which turns on when the light hits it. So one way we've got one and a half volts, the other way we've got one volt. Um, one volt is typical from what I've seen on other other ones. This one also has a one volt drop that way. Um, and then the other way I've actually got nothing because it's actually a different circuit. So these ones we're measuring through resistors across the terminals, so we do get a different reading the other way um, through them. These ones, this one goes to a transistor, uh, this one goes elsewhere. You can, if you're unsure, also like it's it's almost impossible that multiple optocouplers on the same board are going to be defective. So you can take measurements from another one and compare them. See that's one volt drop as well. So is that one. So we're pretty confident that's a reading we should have. Um, now on the other side, um, I guess you don't want to see a short, and you don't want to see, yeah, anything other than a short. I've never seen one go short, but they do stop working. I think they maybe go open circuit, or the LED goes open circuit or something. Um, now measuring this one, um, I have actually got kind of a short resistance mode we get 72 ohms and if we look at the circuit we've got that comes as a capacitor here there's a diode here there's a resistor but that's not across the other pin so we don't count that so there's a, a capacitor and a diode across this pin, so maybe one of those two are bad. Um, then one side goes to, it looks like, here, where there's a wire jumper to here, and then off into the circuit elsewhere. Um, in fact, that's our negative rail coming in here. So that would make sense. So one side uh, goes to negative. And the other side goes to okay so we follow this it goes 
under here, under this diode, and then under this resistor to our control IC. So that's our feedback line to the IC. Now that IC is not going to switch properly if it doesn't get the proper feedback. Now we have to find out why we have quite a low resistance there. Um, it's lucky for us in a way that um, we have almost, almost an identical circuit to look at. So up here it looks like it's kind of been replicated. It almost goes so far as to say this circuit controls our output for the um, amplifier stage. So let's just do a, a diode measurement on that one. Oh, resi resistance at the moment, yeah, 13,000 ohms. We go diode measurement. We're probably not going to get much. There's 1.4 volt and nothing. And this one is 1.6 volt and nothing. Trying to see if we have a similar arrangement. Is that chip up the same way? Uh, is it the same chip even? Uh, I think it's a different chip, so we can't really count that. So we don't really know. So feedback pin is this one from this optocoupler. Okay, so we're looking at this um, possible short slash low resistance. Uh, we kind of saw a voltage previously. Like it was flickering, it was trying to switch. Um, that kind of suggests that that chip is okay. So let's focus back over here. Is the opto bad? Is the capacitor bad? Or is our diode bad? It's probably just as simple as to take it all off the board and test it. There's not a lot of copper on this board and it's only single sided. So we don't need a lot of heat when using hot air. Just got to be careful because this sort of trace can peel off quite easily and um, succumb to being overheated. I think these components, I oh know, I thought they may have been glued down. Actually, I'm going to take that off and move it. Oh. And I'll take that off. Let's just see what are our capacitor measures at. No, no shorted capacitor. And what's our diode reading at the moment? Make sure we're not connected there. Oh, we are connected there. 0. 0.6. So our diode's okay. And somehow this resistor, which is just a jumper, a zero ohm jumper, is um goes to here and then stops goes to here we have a normal reading here but somehow we have a low resistance back to here so maybe it's our chip I hope not maybe it's our optocoupler I'm going to take the optocoupler off first turn that air down a bit Um, well, that can, I'll just stick that somewhere else for the time being. So it doesn't blow away. <laughs> There you go, that was glued on. So what's our reading with no optocoupler? Same! Ha! <laughs> so there's nothing wrong with the optocoupler. Okay. I think before we go pulling the chip off, let's just plug it in and take some measurements. Might be trying to jump the gun. Uh, 
uh, camera. Do we have uh, at the end of our fuse with uh, where we've got negative here and our fuse to here, we should have our uh, 320 volts. Cool. And on our output, we're going to have uh, should have nothing, which we do. Now, why do we have nothing? What's going on? What if I measure from ground to one side of our optocoupler here? We've got nothing, and here, nothing. This optocoupler, nothing. So we've got power in and nothing happening. Do we have voltage on our switching IC? 320 volts there, nothing there. No, no, nothing there. That's, that's really doing a whole lot of nothing. What's up here? Nothing. And one more pin goes nowhere. Right beside the 320. Yeah, okay, so not a whole lot going on there. Perhaps that IC is actually dead. Should it have? 300 volts actually. There's our jumper from the fuse through to here. Let's have a look at this IC. Does it run on 300 volts as well? No. There's a whole lot of nothing going on over here as well. It should come through here. So there's 113 and then over here 2. I think we need a bit more than 2 volts, don't we? Is that resistor burnt out? 2 volts for a supply feed to... What's on the other side of that transistor? Nothing. Yeah, so we've got no voltage happening to power this section here by the look of it. And then it definitely is 300 volts on the chip here. Um, and off to our circuit here. Which has 320. Is this one of those self-igniting rails that should have some flyback effect? Here's a diode. Maybe it should be self-generating when you first plug it in. Well, I guess the uh, MOSFETs don't always fail short circuit, do they? So let's remove and test the proper tester. Feel free to desolder in a manner of your choosing. I choose to add a bit of fresh solder. And I will grab the solder pump. Being only single sided board, there's not a lot of um not a lot of track left to worry about with heat, no have to worry about through holes and trying to absorb all of the solder through the through holes. Get it nice and hot, and one suck of the pump, and it's probably enough to do it. It's a little bit trickier because the pins are so close together. We'll get the end ones, and maybe just use a bit of braid on the uh, other one. Oh. Bounced it around too much. You have to kind of push down as it releases to fight the recoil. <laughs> Only other problem now is the heat sink. Um, they always do this, okay? So manufacturers, for whatever reason, they always mount something right in front of the part you need to get off. So you cannot get a screwdriver in there and just remove it as it sits. Uh, almost always, I mean... Look, there's a giant capacitor right in the way. Transformer right in the way. Come down here, more stuff in the way. There's always stuff on the output, I guess, that, that as it flows through, it's always going to be a larger component. Uh, I need a bit more heat. So I'm going to desolder the heat sinks. It's like one of the messiest ways of desoldering something for sure. But uh, 
Now just be careful, we've got a little surface mount resistor there. It is um, it'll be 384, so if I destroy it, I know what value to put back on there, but keep having to keep the pump this side of the, the thing to make sure I don't crack it. That's all good. I'll give it a bit of a, a wiggle, see if we're loose. And uh, watching the pins to make sure they move. Looks like they all move. We should be safe to pull it off. They all except one. That's that one there. Oh, maybe it's a bit more than one. There we go. I can't find a schematic. I found a service manual for the whole machine. And much like some of the TVs, they left off the power board. I don't know why they do that. It's kind of annoying. It's like the power supply is made by someone else, or they just want you to replace the whole thing as one unit. Let's see what this says. It is a resistor. Well, that shouldn't be a resistor. That should be a MOSFET. Let's try that again, make sure I've got... What, what legs have I got where? I've got uh, two and three and three. Yeah, okay, I need to fix that. Okay, this says it's a twin diode package. Well, that's not going to switch anything. Let's have a look at that. What's the, what's, what is this thing? It's a, so, in diode mode, if we, if this is a MOSFET and we measure gate to drain, that can't be right. 0.6, gate source shorted, drain source nothing. In reverse, we have drain source is our body diode. We have a gate source short, possibly. Let's find the data sheet to be absolutely sure. P4NK80ZFP. It's your garden variety MOSFET. 2.4 ohms on. That seems quite high. What do we got down here? Continuous current. Four or five amps, um, 800 odd volts, 24 amp pulse current, and RDS on of 2.4 ohms. Wow, I guess that's all they had back in the day. I thought that seems quite high. I'm sure there are a lot high, a lot lower resistances these days, like milli ohms. You know, what kind of turn off delays has it got? 66 nanoseconds. 27 nanoseconds on time, turn on time, delay, 66 nanoseconds off, as long as it's not slower than that. <laughs> see what I've got. Yeah, oh, here we go. 600 volt rated. Uh, VGS plus or minus 30. Are we good there? Let's see what we're looking on. Uh, VGS plus or minus 20. Hmm. I wonder what it's being driven at. Maybe that won't be driven fully on. Maybe it will. Uh, 20 volts versus 30 volts. Uh, 7 amp. Well, that's absolutely fine. And pulse current's good. 45 watt. Yeah, I'm just a little concerned about the uh, gate VGS voltage um, similar response time in a pinch we could probably use this I don't know how much current the supply is supposed to provide but um, it's uh, it's all I've got at the moment maybe I just go for a walk and look at some junk see if I can find one on something else this is looking promising from a PlayStation 
something. I think. Um, this is a 6R125P6 MOSFET on the left uh, in the package that we need. And if we go to here, we can see it's 600 volt rated, which is plenty. It's a continuous pulse current or drain current of about 19 to 30 amps, which is which is just fine. Um, as per that there, this is only rated at 5 amps, so more than enough. Um, plus or minus 20 volts on the gate, which we can see here, minus 20 to plus 20. Um, apparently it varies with frequency. I think we'll give it a crack. Um, and an RDS. It's oh, here we go. Rise time nine nine nanoseconds. Off time forty four nanoseconds. And it's a little bit slower to turn off, but it turns on a lot faster. That turn off time can be critical, though. I think. I think I'm going to try that. I'm going to rip it out. If it tests good, we'll put it in and see what happens. Scratch that. It was a it was a dud. <laughs> um. I think I found another one though. So let's see if that will work. 500 volt rated. Some old laptop charger. Uh, we'll go for that one. And I think, oh, I've already had this off once. <laughs> Pop it on the tester then. Interestingly, if it'll let me, there we go. Um, if you short pins one, two, and three together, it goes into a self um, self test mode uh, and I did that accidentally because the last one I tried to test was shorted all through right through so cool okay that looks promising that'll just solder on at least enough for testing figure out if, go buy a new one tomorrow hopefully if my local electronics shop is worth their salt which they usually aren't they may have something suitable in stock if it does work, we won't run it for long, obviously, because um, it won't be bolted to the heatsink. I don't think I've forgotten anything, so let's plug it in and see if it explodes. Well, hopefully the fuse goes if it's gonna. Three, two, one. Well, do we have anything coming out of this? Ah, uh, still nothing. Did it blow our fuse? Is that 300? 320 and this side of the fuse still 320 so while that was bad still doesn't work I'm thinking that chip has probably failed can we get one it's got to be some surplus out there right look what I found an anti-static bag with PWM controllers in it so they do exist they are still plentiful they come with a massive pouch of desiccant. We have two attempts at making this work. I need to remove our previous attempt at a, at, a, at a MOSFET replacement because I also have new MOSFET, the proper one. Clean up the old thermal paste. A little bit of alcohol to get it flowing. kind of separates. There's like a, a silicon, I don't know if it's a silicon fluid or what it is, it's a clear fluid and it uh, separates inside the um, syringe. So there's our syringe and it all sort of, yeah, somehow the white stuff separates. And when you give it a squeeze, all of the clear stuff comes out and you get none of the actual paste. So um, I just like to agitate it a bit by put the cap on and and um, pull it under vacuum and push it around a little bit just to try and reabsorb that into the mix before I squeeze it out and that seems to work. I don't know if there's uh, any other better, <laughs> better ways of doing it. I'd be concerned if I just let it separate and then just squeezed all of the clear stuff out if it would have an effect on its performance I suppose. Ow! 
is a uh, nothing like cutting your own thread. <laughs> now, yeah, always going to rotate when you do the screw up, so just got to try and fight, <laughs> hold it at one side to stop it rotating, get it tight, kind of enough. Might be able to actually hold it. And... Oh, yeah. Now I've got to bend the leg on it, don't I? See how that goes. Cool. I like to alternate just so that it gives the um, the chip a chance to cool off that pin. So if I do, if I've got a couple of ICs to do, you know, I'll do one pin on that one, one pin on that one, and so on, and. Um, I don't know, it's entirely not necessary. You could solder all three at once, but I just think that, you know, give the chip a chance to cool off. Just make sure you don't have any uh, bridges between the legs. Uh, it can be quite easy to do with something so close together. So I wonder which video will be the changing of the syringe. I'm almost run out. You now I can give it a twist, and it's off. So we'll get one pin tacked on initially, which will make it that one. Let's plug this thing in one last time, because if this doesn't fix it, I'm kind of at a loss. Here we go! Better be quick, the camera battery is about to die. Okay, what do we got? Yes! 13 and a half! Hey, magic! It's the first time I've seen a switch mode controller IC fail where it hasn't blown a hole in the top of it, but hey, these things happen. So let's reassemble and test. Screws in. Upper chassis on. Frontage attached. Well, that took far too long, just for test. Plugged in. The fans came on. That's interesting. Okay, there's one fan going in the back. I forgot to plug in the other fan. So I'll fit the other fan module for the uh, amplifier. It's just loosely set there for now, but plugged in. Let's see if that one spins as well. It does. Okay, so everything spins and we've got the flashing blue light. Let's hit the power button. Aha! Ooh. Lots of lights. Please connect all speakers. Oh, yep. Push the different modes. Game EQ. Not in use. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Football. <laughs> How do we eject the CD? Aye. Alright, has this got a headphone socket out? Um, no, it's got a microphone in. But, uh, no, that's a shame. It's got USB. You can play uh, media off that as well. That's pretty cool. See if I can't get a signal out of this. Let's see if our amplifier voltages are present. 62 and a half, and I think they're all tied together. It's good. And then 23.6, and then ground, and then we switch over and go up the other way. Negative, negative 62. Cool. And a red one at the end is minus 48 for some reason. The entire power supply seems to be working. We're going to just have to throw it back together and presume that the only fault was the fact the power supply went out. I don't think there's anything wrong with anything else. 
if I hear otherwise, I guess there'll be another video, but uh, if you don't hear anything from me, it must be working perfectly. So I hope you liked that one. Um, give it a thumbs up if you did. Feel free to comment. Let me know if you've ever seen one of these things. Thanks for watching.